Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm just going to pass over to Elish who can start things off. Hi everyone. So I am so excited to introduce the second product tank of 2021. And before I do that though, we're just gonna have some brief housekeeping. So if you wanna follow us on Twitter, um, check us out at product tank BFS, or if you want to have, if you want to um, tweet throughout this session, um, it's hashtag product tank Belfast. So uh, we we are broadcasting live on YouTube, as you can tell. So do say hello in the comment box on the right hand side of the screen, and make sure to tell us where you're watching from as well. Um, I know it's not quite the same as attending in person, so we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. Do make sure to leave any comments or questions for our guest speaker, David Bland. Um, you know, post them any point throughout the event. Don't just leave them for the Q&A, you know, because they might get missed. So we will have a Q&A session at the end. And Stephen, your very friendly Product Tank Belfast co-organizer, will be picking up um, viewers' questions to discuss with David. So... I just want to bring up our next event. We'll be putting it on Meetup tomorrow. So it's a session that will be run by Bizarre Voice Belfast and we'll be able to explore a number of approaches to product discovery. There'll be a focus on continuous discovery and the benefits of that approach. So that's on the 20th of April at 7 p.m. Also, you know, if you're interested in speaking in any of the meetups of the future, um, get in touch with um, one of us or if you want to sponsor um, and May's event, for instance, um, do reach out to one of your very friendly product tank organizers and you can get our details on meetup as well. So I want to thank tonight's sponsor, Bizarre Voice Belfast. Um, you know, usually they're um, quite kindly um, putting that towards the likes of food and drink. Really sadly, we can't do that today. I hope you're all having a nice beer and some pizza at home. Um, but all of that, the money that would usually go towards that will be donated directly to people living in poverty in Belfast through Esther. So um, I don't want to hold you back any more from tonight's event. I'm super excited to introduce David Bland. He is CEO and founder of Precoil and co-author of Testing Business Ideas. Um, I know I am a huge fan of a lot of the techniques that are within that book. It would definitely be worthwhile sort of um you know, getting it and checking out a lot of the resources that he does offer because ultimately we're always trying to reduce risk in our business ideas and by running experiments, you know, that's how we go about doing that. So enough of me talking about it. Um, over to David. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'm glad the book landed so well with people. It was certainly, you know, we tested our way through it, but at the same time, it, it's, it's usually... Uh, uh, you don't know until you you put it out there. So awesome. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of share some stuff with you all today. And from there, um, we can just see where Q&A goes and, and such. But basically, um, what I want to do is uh, draw with you all uh, today. So I, I'm somewhat new to StreamYard. I'm assuming people can see my screen I'm sharing. Is this true? Um, not just yet. Not yet. Mm, let me try sharing it again. Share. Share. Yeah. Now we can see it. Good. Okay. Cool. So um, I give them a little bit about myself. So David J. Bland um, worked with a few startups early in my career. Went to school for design. Um, one of the startups I joined, we, we thought we were... Um, a B2C startup, we ended up being a B2B startup. So that was probably huge and influential in my career. And then uh, about 10 years ago, I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and started uh, really working with startups and accelerators there, but also big companies. And um, kind of fast forward to 2019, uh, Alex and I, uh, Alex Osterwalder and I published a book uh, based on our collaborations of, hey, how do we get people to go and test ideas and think of this more like a scientific um, approach? And we've learned a lot, you know? I mean, the whole kind of, like the first book that Alex wrote is 10 years old now, right? And and so is like Lean Startup from Eric Ries. And and so we've learned a lot in the, in the last decade about these these processes. So I think it was, it was time to have something a little more um, recent. And also, you know, I kept running in these teams who, you know, they knew how to do surveys and landing pages, maybe um, interviews. And then they would sort of just run out of options and build the whole thing. And I think there are so many options available. So 
um, that was my intent was to give something, you know, back to people and give them, un get them unstuck. So, um, the learning objective today is pretty much to help you all de-risk your product or business ideas you're working on. So, you know, hopefully I can give you some tools and techniques today, a way of thinking about things that'll help you kind of break down your risk and, um, you know, uh, try to make progress instead of just wringing your hands or losing sleep at night <laughs> about something that you're worried about, uh, being able to sort of, you know, uh, make progress and know if you're on the right track. And then I do have a code of conduct for all of my sessions I do. Uh, it's basically the Bill and Ted code of conduct, which is be excellent to one another. So when we do a Q&A or if we're doing sharing out, just use respectful tone and, um, and, and have fun. Okay. So um, what I wanted to do is I want to kind of zoom in on um, this tool, which you probably have all seen before, and, and sketch out some stuff for you. So, you know, back when Alex originally uh, created this tool, right? Um, he was getting his PhD in business model ontology at the University of Lausanne. And he put this kind of on, as a white paper out there and then uh, just companies started using it. So it was really interesting to see how people got value out of it right away. And it's, it's made it into almost any like accelerator I go into, um, you know, MBA program, entrepreneurship program, but as well as big companies trying to figure out, okay, how do we visualize and test our business model? And what we did, and this was all so uh, Eve, so was Alex is uh, co-founder and co-author of the other books. So I was sort of the, the first person beyond that kind of circle to write with Alex, which I, I feel honored to do. Um, and we started layering in, you know, design thinking. So this idea of desirability, you know, so for the for for those of you at home, you know, thinking through sort of like what's your value proposition, your customer segment, your relationships channels, like thinking about desirability risk, you know, in, in your canvas. And then viability kind of being at the bottom here with regards to cost and revenue. So this kind of should we question it question, you should have a you know moral compass, obviously make ethical business decisions. And on top of that, it has to sustain in some way. So I, I do think putting this off is problematic. You know, um, you know, in Silicon Valley, I think we, we've kind of gotten this habit of just saying, well, we'll figure out the business model later, just get traction. And that doesn't always end well. Uh, even if companies raise money, um, they ended up, you know, taking a bunch of money without a really viable business model. And then all their competitors just kind of die away because they can't compete. <laughs> and then they go public and then they still don't have a viable business model. So um, I, I do think thinking about your business model early, um, especially if you're doing like pre product market fit stuff, really early stage, being able to reason through it, it's going to change. But thinking it through, I think it is really helpful. And then, and then feasibility. And feasibility is much more around the can you do it question. And this is where we slightly kind of deviate from IDEO's definition and Stanford D, cool, D, D School's definition of feasibility. I kind of go back to like Larry Keeley's version who created the Keeley triangle uh, of desirable, viable, feasible. And it's, it's not just technical feasibility, it's also anything else that would create, like prevent you from delivering. OK, so think regulatory, especially if we have insurance folks on, on the on the call here or in, in finance. Being able to say, well, so it's like the first startup I joined, we were um, a platform for, for fintech, right? We were for banks. And just because we could transfer money online didn't mean we were allowed to. <laughs> you know, we still had to go through all the regulatory bodies. Um, we had to work with Accord here in the United States and DTCC to clear the money. And so it kind of didn't matter if we had a platform that worked, we still had to nav navigate all the regulatory stuff. So thinking about feasibility risk, you know, beyond just the technical risk of can you do it quite often, you know, it's, um, you know, especially in EU, right? You have GDPR, you have here in the United States, we have um, patient privacy laws that are also like, you can't just violate HIPAA compliance and things here. So um, being able to kind of navigate that too. And so what we found in doing this is that when people are kind of walking through their business model, for example, and they're saying, okay, you know, who are my customers? What, what's our value proposition to them? So not just your product, but, you know, the benefit or perceived benefit of using, you know, the product or service. And then uh, what are your channels of so acquisition and distribution? And what's the nature of your relationship with them? So is it automated or is it direct one-to-one? -one? Is it a one-time thing? Is it more recurring? You'll notice a lot of that is desirability risk. Um, so being able to work through that, I think, is really key. And then when you start dipping down into, okay, how do we generate money? What are our revenue streams? 
then you start touching on you know a little bit of viability risk. And then when you move backstage, right? If you think of your key activities, so think verbs, like verbs that you need to do to, to make this work. And then resources, which are nouns, so physical or digital, uh, things that you need. Then you start kind of navigating into, okay, well, what's our cost structure, you know? Cause you can pull from your activities and resources there. And then um, your key partners, uh, I usually even even start talking about that last, right? So I don't, I don't necessarily go left or right. Um, Alex is also, you know, really built upon this model in his book, The Invincible Company, which he has a ton of patterns, um, you know, like front stage, backstage, different kinds of patterns um, of different companies who were able to be successful. And the way I kind of view it, and it's kind of going back to Alex's old white paper is, you know, it's kind of a flow, you know, it's almost like a systems thinking <laughs> diagram in a way, like how do you deliver your value, right? And acquire customers. What's the nature of that relationship with them? And then how do you generate revenue? Right. And then on the backstage, looking at activities and resources, you can say, well, what, you know, what are our costs incurred from there? And then if you partner with somebody, you're probably partnering with them because they bring an activity that you don't have uh, or can't do, a resource um, that you don't have, or potentially even a channel that helps you reach your customer. And so I find that, you know, my usage of this tool anyway is much more around the relationships between things and um, helping founders or helping early stage product managers or, or innovation folks at corporations understand, okay, what are the relationships in the in, in this model? And so I think quite like what happened over time was we just focused on the business plan, which is like, you know, your five-year plan, you're using Excel or Google Sheets. I, I still think the plan is valuable. Um, however, I think it's really dangerous to write a business plan without first understanding the business model. Because really, your model should be built upon, a, you know, your plan should be built upon a model. And so I think sometimes we uh, skip that step and then we write creative fiction for five years <laughs> and then realize, oh, uh, our whole model is flawed. <laughs> and all that time I spent writing this plan is useless. So, um, you know, if you're at a startup, right, investors want you to kind of think through the process of, of writing a business plan. And I, and I kind of get that. Um, you know, uh, there's this idea called the, the uh, idea maze, right? And, and they want you to know that this is maze and your your entry point is, is sort of your your business, but then how are you gonna navigate all these things where other companies failed and everything? Like, I, I think it's a useful model, but at the same time, having a way to articulate your, biz, your business overall, like the relationships I think is, is super important. So um, building off of that, and so the book kind of picks up where business model generation and value prop design books left off. Left off. Um, what we began to do is say, look, um, when teams are, are kind of working through um, these issues, and I, I wrote this book just like I was coaching teams, so that's probably why the voice and everything in tone lands with people, because uh, I think the two best pieces of advice I got from my editor were, call, were call the book what it does, because <laughs> we had all kinds of, like, like really clever book titles that were inside jokes. And he's like, no, no, don't do that. And then um, write the book like you're coaching teams. And I thought, oh, wow, like I was just stressing about how to word things. And then I realized, just imagine I'm sitting in front of a team, which I do all the time. Now it's virtually in the pandemic. But um, how would I talk to them if they're in this situation? You know, what advice would I give? What questions would I ask? And so that's why the book's written that way. And so uh, when you think about this, it's sketching out your canvas and then writing down what are all these things that have to be true for us to succeed. And, and I call these assumptions. I, I think sometimes we get tied up with assumption versus hypothesis. Um, my view on this is an, a hypothesis is an assumption that is testable, precise, and discreet. All right. So that's how I differentiate the two. I know it's not perfect, but an assumption could be anything we write down but it, it might all, not always be testable or uh, pr like really well worded. But um, what I try to do is um, basically get them out of people's heads first and then refine them. So one of the things we do when we write these down, I like using colors. So I use orange for desirability. I normally use green for viability and then I use blue or sometimes purple for feasibility, but it really the colors don't matter. It's like a stylistic choice. I just like using them. Um, and then we try to write these down with this like kind of preface of we believe, all right? So the reason I do that, and I don't do these as questions. So another kind of point of feedback is, well, a hypothesis is a question. It's like, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, 
what I try to do is write these down as beliefs. So I just say, hey, write down your beliefs, <laughs> write down these big assumptions that have to be true for us to succeed. And so usually, um, if you get the right people in the room, and so normally who I kind of pull in here is you think of all this desirability, right? You think design, um, research can help, right? So you think of design and, and research for um, desirability-like assumptions should be able to answer a lot of that kind of do they uh, type questions. And then for, um, for viability, right? We usually pull in product um, and sometimes uh, finance people that can start talking through the numbers, all right? And then for um, backstage, we talk about uh, feasibility, right? So feasibility, it, it's often tech, right? Because you do want to talk about some uh, technical feasibility, but also um, it could be legal, right? It could be other folks that need to be uh, in the room for, for you to basically answer these questions. Now, if you are familiar with balanced teams, which I'm a huge fan of, I used to go to like old school balanced team meetups uh, back before the pandemic in San Francisco. Uh, they they were amazing. You know, it's like product design, engineering, like working together as a team, like, you know, because um, I feel that a lot of modern product development and business development, you do need a cross-functional team. I do think our definition of cross-functional might be expanding. Uh, however, when you do these exercises, you want people in the room that can kind of help you pull out these assumptions and, and write them down. And so this is this is one of the framings I use. And so when we start going over to um, to map them, right? So first, it's just like getting them out of your head, and that's step one. But then um, I have this little like two by two called uh, assumptions mapping. And so basically, I started picking this up while working with them. Um, Jeff Gothelf and Josh Seiden at Neo. Uh, they wrote uh, Lean UX, Sense and Respond, um, Outcomes <laughs> over Outputs. Like there's all kinds of great books they've written, but um, they had this two by two in there that I love to prioritize uh, hypothesis with. But um, I felt like people kept getting um, tripped up on it, and so what I did is I kind of kept playing with the axes, and so I ended up on um, have evidence and no evidence, kind of like in collaborating with Alex. We kept getting the situations where people would just try to convince the team that they were right. And we finally got to the point where it's like, do you have any observable evidence, qualitative or quantitative, to support this belief that you wrote down, this big assumption? And uh, they're like, well, no. And I was like, okay, well, it goes over here. <laughs> so it's really hard when you have you know strong personalities in the room to, to get to that point. And then um, are these important or unimportant? And I know you might say, well, I only write down the things that are important. And uh, yes. However, not everything's the most important thing. So think of important to you, what has to be true for this to succeed. And really, you know, what, what kind of Eric Reese framed this in Lean Startup was more of like the leap of faith assumption. Um, and, and that's kind of like goes way back before like the Kierkegaard probably. <laughs> but this idea of desirability, viability, feasibility, what I think is a really cool kind of output of doing this is that you get your team to sort of prioritize by talking to each other. So we do recommend talking when you do this exercise. And then anything below the line, you just kind of don't worry about for now. Um, three to six months, you you know that might change. But for now, based on what you know today in your term, where I'd want you to focus your experimentation is on the things that are most important, where you have the least amount of evidence to support the statement. Now, I've learned this the hard way. So when I first kind of uh, moved to the, the San Francisco Bay Area and I was in, you know, coaching teams and all these giant companies, I would just get them excited about experimentation. So um, there were good and bad to that, by the way. So, so where I messed up was I would get teams excited by experiment and they're like, let's do a landing page. And it's like, OK, but what kind of hypothesis are we trying to test? And we weren't prioritizing things quite this well back then. And so what would happen is it would be stuff that's kind of unimportant that they already know, but they thought it'd be cool to run an experiment on because they just wanted to run experiments. And the point is not to run experiments. The point is to de-risk your business. And so I know I wrote a book with like <laughs> 200 pages of experiments. And I'm telling you, the point of it is not experiments. 
the, the experiments are only to de-risk your strategy, right? So you want to generate evidence so that you can make a better investment decision. And without this, I was really struggling with teams because I'd get them excited and they run experiments, but then they would still fail in a big way because they were kind of ignoring all the big risks that we had where we, we just weren't focusing our experimentation. So now I, I do a little differently, uh, which is reflected in the book, which is, you know, what's the most important thing? Which, what's the least amount of evidence? And then from there, this is where sort of those 44 experiments um, come into play. So what happens is if I zoom out a little bit, um, you know, you kind of sketch out your canvas, write down your assumptions, map them, and then start refining kind of that top right corner and then choosing at the same time, choosing experiments that match your risk. And so what we did in the book, and it was pretty ambitious effort, um, I would say, is to kind of apply a taxonomy to all that. And so what we did is we said, all right, so based on like what we've seen with teams, um, what do these cost? So how expensive are they to run? How long does it take to set them up uh, and run them? And it, initially I had these as one kind of piece. And then Alex and I kept talking. He's like, these are actually two because you, some are really quick to, to set them up, but they take a long time to run. Others take a long time to set up, but you run them for a short time. So we did break them out. Um, we also list out kind of the capabilities you need. The good news is a lot of this is changing too, even since we've written the book, because um, you know, a lot of these no code, low code tools really kind of bring down the cost and um, they still have a learning curve to them, but you can you can build things if you're not necessarily a programmer or um, with all these landing page generators, you don't have to have a, a degree in design. You can use templates, right? So you don't have to always go hire designers. And then evidence strength, which I'll get into in a moment because I think weak and strong, but I think people are still confused on that part. And then what theme, desirability, feasibility, or viability. And so when we first started organizing the book, I thought, oh, we'll just do like one section on desirability experiments and one section on feasibility and one section on viability. And it was a complete flop. Like we were overlooking the mountains in Switzerland because <laughs> I literally flew over, you know, to write with Alex. And then Alan came, our, our lead designer. And I was like, Alex, this is not working. Um, you know, I've been doing this kind of work for almost 10 years and I thought I had this great structure and it's like falling apart on me. And um, we realized that, you know, a lot of these experiments apply to multiple themes. And so organizing the book that way didn't make sense, but we didn't want to lose the theme. So we still have the themes, but we just organize the book in a, a slightly different way. And so um, what I wanted to kind of touch on, though, that I think it's in the book, but I think it's quite often overlooked, is the nuances for evidence strength. And we cover this in our masterclass that we do. Um, our next one's coming up in May. Alex and I are doing a three-day masterclass on this. But when you think of um, this idea of strength in, in your evidence, I think uh, we still have some ways to go as far as articulating this and getting teams to really get their head around it. Because quite often I see teams make really big bets on a low strength of evidence. And so what we try to do is you think of high and low. Right. So what people say is low evidence, <laughs> but if you can move them up to something that they do, that is higher evidence. So I really get nervous when teams like interview five customers and then they want to build the whole app. It's like, that's pretty, not that you shouldn't interview customers. I do believe you should. Um, but just be mindful that, um, it's, weak strength of evidence, you know, because uh, there's this gap in what people say and what they do. It's like spouse theory, theory in action. Um, there's also, you know, this idea of opinion, right, versus fact. And so opinion is, again, um, pretty weak strength of evidence, and you want to get to something higher, which are like facts. Um, the same can be said on, on lab versus uh, real world. So what people do in a lab setting is pretty weak, but what, what happens in the real world is well, much stronger because they're not biased by this lab setting, whether you invited them in or you have some kind of opt-in and do some kind of virtual lab. It's, it's, um, it, it can be, not that you shouldn't do it again, but just be mindful that it's rather weak evidence. And then going from investment, it's like this like low investment, which would be, let's say, someone giving up their email, to a high investment, which is like people paying for something. 
um, that's also different. And so I think with strength of evidence, uh, we have a lot of work to do to help people understand that you kind of want to run experiments for the same hypothesis, maybe multiple times, but you also want to go from weak to stronger evidence. And, and I think this is something that we're still, still grappling with. Um, so, so basically in the book, what we did is we, um, we essentially organize things as discovery and validation. So we're pulling from um, kind of Steve Blank's work in Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, and, and he certainly influenced my thinking over the years with Lean Startup. And so, you know, we think discovery, they're more open-ended directional hypotheses. And you're moving from sort of, um, on an evidence situation anyway, you're, you're moving from kind of like none or very little to some. And, and so there are all, all kinds of techniques you can use. Uh, and we've kind of uh, framed them desirable, viable, feasible. And, and basically you can start doing stuff beyond just interviews and surveys. And so try to give people some um, different options about building evidence without building product. Because <laughs> uh, we jumped the build way, way too early. And then with validation, you know, uh, similar Again, um, you know, St Steve Blank frames this like customer discovery, customer validation. We were trying to get beyond just customer, so we were going more with overall discovery, overall validation. Um, you know, this is where you typically find your MVPs, and and so this idea of a minimum viable product. Um, again, I, I've said this multiple times, but I tried to write a book without using the phrase at all because it's become some twisted <laughs> over the years. Um, many don't even know that it wasn't like Eric Ries acquainted. It was Frank Robinson in like 2001 where he framed uh, MVP. Um, and the, uh, the page is still up, by the way, for, uh, like he, he has uh, how he came up with it. And uh, if you look at the original framing, it's very much about risk and value exchange. And now it means everything. <laughs> like it's like, uh, I, I literally hear corporations say things like, uh, oh, it's gonna be a year before we release our MVP. And I was like, how big is this MVP? <laughs> it takes us a year. Um, so I tried to bring the conversation down to like a more tactical level. And so, so what I try to do is say, okay, I, the kinds I've seen are concierge, which is basically you're manually delivering the, the value. So there's almost no tech involved. You're hand holding people through the experience and it's obvious a person is involved. Wizard of Oz, which is kind of like concierge, except that it's not obvious there's a person involved. And so it's kind of like um, man behind the curtain, you know, like, like the book and the movie. Um, a lot of bots and things are, are Wizard of Oz, I found. And then uh, single feature MVP, which I actually published an article about today. Um, so like the Amazon Dash, I think that's a perfect example of a single feature MVP. A little physical button, you put it next to your, your washing machine and it says Tide or whatever the detergent is, you press a button, you know, and it's shipped to you. Now, what I find really interesting what Amazon did though, um, was they used that to inform Alexa, and they used that to inform their uh, Dash subscription service. So it was pretty much an experiment. They were never really going to scale that thing. Um, and now there's not a button on the outside of your washer. Now your washer is like a smart washer and can just talk to Alexa and order you stuff. And so, but they were able to kind of gauge purchase behavior and test it out before rolling out something really expensive. So I think it was really smart of them. Um, other single feature MVPs, you can think of like early days Foursquare, where you just checked in, you know, to a spot. So there are other uh, kind of uh, versions of that. And then uh, Mashup, which, um, you know, basically I, I say it's a lot of the no code movement or, or low code. Um, you can, it's amazing what you can do even since I've written this book. So the book's only about like a year and a half. I think there's been like a couple hundred no code uh, <laughs> platforms launched since then. Uh, one just got acquired by Zapier. Uh, they just acquired Maker, um, I think it was Maker, Maker Co or Maker Pad, I forget the name. Um, but it's, um, you know, literally I see people recreate the Uber Eats app in, in no code. It's like, you can create uh, Airbnb in no code. <laughs> like you don't have, to, you don't even have to learn how to code to create Airbnb now. Um, now there's a learning curve again to the platforms like Bubble and uh, Dalo and all these platforms, but it's pretty amazing what you can do. And, and they last like one to two years, right? I mean, as long as the platform doesn't get acquired, right? <laughs> you, it, before my last company um, was called Neo and and we were doing like MVPs as a service and we we're backed by Eric Ries and, and all these other folks, folks. And that's where I worked with Jeff and Josh and Gift Constable and Lex Roman and Andy Planberg and Sam McAfee. It was an amazing group. 
And we'd always have these conversations about well, what tech stack are we going to use for this MVP? And that was like completely pointless. We would just, <laughs> we, if I was to do that again today, I would totally just use no code and we would get it done in like a couple of days rather than, you know, trying to realize like what stack we're going to use and everything for an MVP. So it's just amazing. Um, so I want to give you like just a couple of ways of how I use this with teams um, and, and kind of give you some, some framing. So with ads, you know, I treat ads as experiments. And with ads, um, I, I it's funny. It's so many times you're trying to find your early adopter, and um, it's like, how do we how do we even find them online, offline? Um, well, this is mostly online. But I love this framing from from Steve, which is like, do people have the problem? Are they aware? And are they actively seeking a solution to the problem? And I gave this as like a, a workshop at Lean Startup Week in San Francisco once, just as a like session to just like show people how to make stuff actionable. Because I love that framing. And then people go, well, I don't know what that means, though. Uh, I don't know how to make it actionable. So one way to make it actionable is, you know, if I'm working with the team and we're trying to push ads to people using like Facebook or something, right? Um, sometimes it flops. Like one time we, I was working with the team and we were trying to push ads to people to get to a page for a signup. And we only had a 1% conversion on our signup. And, and so I would want that to be like 10 or 15%. Um, at least. And so they're about ready to give up. And, and before we gave up, we said, hey, where would you go if you were seeking a solution to this problem? Like, what's the observable evidence? Like, where would we go to find evidence of people seeking a solution? And and basically what we came to is, well, people go on Google and they do Google search. So let's do Google search only ads and use the same page. Um, use the same page uh, and basically same ad right? But catch them when they're seeking a solution, right? Smaller, smaller section of people, but you catch them when they're actively seeking a solution. We had the same page. This is insane. We had a 40% conversion on that page. Now that is an outlier. That is really high, but 40% is a lot more than 1%. And so what I try to do is target this as, you know, think about these as experiments. Think about these as how to um, navigate and go from, hey, are our customers, do they have the problem? Is there any observable evidence they have the problem? Is there any observable evidence that uh, they're aware that they have a problem? Because we all probably have a friend that has problems, but are, they're not aware of their problem. You don't give up on your friends, but you know you have to do some awareness building there. And then have people switched from, are they aware of it to they're seeking a solution to it? And this is what um, what I love how Diana Kanda frames this is, um, or I met way back at a Lean Startup Conference, was, um, is this a headache problem or a migraine problem? And so a headache problem being like, it's a nuisance. I'm not even going to take a solution. I'm not going to seek a solution at all to a migraine, which is like, I have migraine medicine like over here on the shelf, right? So I, I will seek a solution to a migraine. Um, and so being able to frame things as why aren't people seeking a solution? Maybe they um, sought a solution earlier and, and the solution wasn't very good or they couldn't find one and they gave up like there's all kinds of interesting stuff there but when we talk about you know this framing of early adopters you know uh, or, or how steve calls them early um uh, evangelists right um you know basically um what i what i want you to kind of come away with this is can we um define them, right? <laughs> and we don't over optimize for them, but how do how do we find them and treat that as experiment? Because quite often, uh, depending on your sector, you're going to have to, you know, try different things um, until you find something that works. Um, I'll talk a little bit about concierge too here. So with concierge, um, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, concierge is, you know, you're manually delivering the whole thing, right? And so with that, you're delivering the value manually and, and people are paying for it, which I think is really interesting. And you learn a lot because you test all three themes and it gives you pretty strong evidence because it's a real value exchange. Kind of coming back to that old school 2001 definition of MVP of how do you de-risk you know, this thing based on like the value exchange. So um, what's interesting is the pushback I usually get on this is, well, we don't have time to do things that don't scale. So we'd rather just like scale the whole solution <laughs> and spend a year doing so <laughs> and then um, see if we were right. Uh, and quite often you're not, by the way, if you do it that way. Um, 
rather than do something that doesn't scale and, and find out we're wrong earlier. <laughs> it's like, it, it's so counterintuitive. And I think our incentive structure inside companies sometimes uh, encourages this kind of behavior because we're, we're focused on outputs and not outcomes. But um, it's a brilliant, and every time I do it, um, teams get to tap, tap into their creativity and then they get to uh, essentially, you know, uh, create, creatively do something that maybe um, they would have done uh, with software or some other technology. Now, Wizard of Oz is like this, except you sort of like, you know, take the person out of the equation and, and then it's, it, you replace it with, with, with something, you know, may, maybe, you know, a, a bot or something. Um, but basically, um, you know, SMS bot or a chat bot. Um, sometimes we've used something like a landing page that we, we use as a kind of our curtain, right? Our digital curtain. Um, but basically it's still all the folks behind the scenes doing stuff. And, and I think, you know, I, I've, I've seen a lot of AI startups come through accelerators I work with in the Valley and, uh, they're always spreadsheets behind the scenes. <laughs> it's always like an army of people in spreadsheets trying to make it work before they build an algorithm. So I always kind of laugh when people are like, we're an AI startup. I was like, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> like you're basically using, you know, uh, spreadsheets in Excel. But, you know, as long as that value exchange is real, um, pe people will pay for it, right? It doesn't matter if it's a person or a bot. Like um, the fact is you can use what you've learned from this um, experiment to inform your actual algorithms and the design of, you know, of your, of your, your scalable thing. Right. And so, um, but, but I always laugh when people are talking about their, uh, you know, their AI startups. So, um, a couple things. So basically just giving you a kind of high level view here of, um, one, the framing of the canvas, right. And where we extended it. Um, now Alex also has adaptability that he talks about. Um, in the uh, Invincible Company book, and we do touch on it in the master classes. Um, I view adaptability as the stuff that's like around your canvas, so your competitors, your um, regulatory trends, socioeconomic trends, all, all these different things, because your your business doesn't e exist in a vacuum, right? And I view it as you know adaptability is more of that stuff influences your you know your, your assumptions. So for example, if you had a competitor that like was a fast follower and you launched, but they copied you right away, you know, how would you position yourself? What kind of assumptions would you have as a result of that? Or um, there's a new regulatory trend coming that you want to, to help build something around, you know, what kind of assumptions would you have around that? And so uh, we are still kind of reconciling all of that. You know, Alex and I agree on a lot. Um, adaptability is more of like the environment. So think about his first book at the end, which I don't think many people made it to the end. <laughs> it was a great book. There's all kinds of like amazing environment stuff in the back of that book. Um, adaptability is sort of that uh, is, is how I frame it. So in uh, when we made a conscious decision when we were writing testing business ideas, I was like, well, I'm not sure how to run adaptability experiments. So I want to you know not include it in that book. Um, but he kind of built upon that invincible company. And so I do think there's a lot to draw from and we're still learning, you know, as, as we uh, go on this journey too. Um, but sketching it out, writing down sort of your assumptions, getting the right people in the room, tech and legal for um, feasibility, uh, product and finance for viability, design and research, market research, users research for desirability. Um, again, that's just like a core, it could be different people, as long as you have the right people in the room that can answer those questions doing a two by two and saying, okay, uh, what are the most important ones? We have no evidence to really support. And then let's choose experiments that help us learn about those. And so it's very iterative, you know, and basically in the book, you know, we tried to lay this out It's very visual. We had like a professional illustrator, uh, Owen Palmer, who's amazing, uh, based out of the UK, um, professional illustrator, hand draw every experiment. We had this great back and forth because I was, you know, I'm outside San Francisco and he's, you know, in the UK and I would make videos like Loom videos <laughs> over his illustrations going, okay, can we make it do this? And sometimes I would tell him like what I want to draw with Alan. Uh, and then other times it would be like, use your creativity. And what would you draw if I said, this is what the experiment is? Um, by far, one of my favorite ones, I don't have it in here. Uh, they're kind of hidden gems in the book. One is like an ode to Melissa Perry, which is this like copier stapler fax machine thing that she always rants about which i love and there's an inside joke there 
um, in Boomerang. And then um, the uh, ode to Alberto Savoy, who wrote The Right It, who I credit in the book for the pretend to own uh, case study, which is uh, the Palm Pilot with Jeff Hawkins, which is like a wooden block with a chopstick is how they tested it back in the day. Uh, the we have like this fake dog this like cardboard box dog <laughs> it's just like silly but i think um all of that is really important to make this less intimidating to people because i think you know we're all experts and we can talk about tools and methodologies and all that stuff all day but it has to be uh non-threatening and it has to be easily consumable and so we made it a point to just go like all out three full-time designers a professional illustrator um conceptually laying out everything so that people could sort of absorb it in a way. Whereas if I just wrote like this giant wall of text, no one's going to read it. And then they're, they're going <laughs> to, they're basically not going to get value out of it. So we made some very intentional dis decisions about uh, how, how to illustrate it. And so it was pretty fun. Um, so what I've done here is I kind of put a cheat sheet in uh, from the book. Um, so Tendai Vicky helped put these together. Um, who's also amazing. He wrote Corporate Startup and uh, Pirates and Navy. Uh, of just like cheat sheets of um, the, the experiments. So discovery and validation. And what I thought, which would be cool, and I, I'm somewhat new to StreamYard, so I'm not even sure how to, <laughs> to post this out. So maybe one of the producers here could help me uh, with the mural board. But um, what I thought I could do is um, just kind of talk about sequences and sketch one out, and then uh, you know we could do some Q&A a as well. So with the... Um, sequence part so there are two pages in the book that are almost like the most popular pages ever in a book and i almost didn't even include them at all uh, because i thought well we do all these elaborate pairing of like what do i do before an experiment after an experiment and i thought what did, i mean i work with all kinds of different companies and i thought what if we just did you know some sequences about what i've seen about people going from one step to another and it's not even like super well laid out. <laughs> it's just on like two pages. And people always hold up the book and open that page and go, we like, we love this page. And it was always kind of uh, uh, funny to me. And, and so, um, but the point of what I was trying to teach in that was, you know, take what you've learned in one experiment and, and use that to um, design the next. And so sort of a funny kind of story here that we could share. Um, and, and I'll probably get some of the details wrong because it's been a while ago. But um, one of the teams at, uh, in New York was testing um, a dating advice. It was, it was basically like, I'll, I'll make this a little bigger for you. It was uh, a men's dating advice um, chatbot. <laughs> okay. So um, it, it was a bot that would give men dating advice, uh, especially uh, men who were trying to go in on a first date. All right. So how they started approaching that is they did some customer interviews, right? And they started understanding what what are the kind of problems men are experiencing uh, with dating? You know, where do they go for advice? What where's, Where are gaps in the advice where it's not super actionable? And then from there, it was like, okay, let's take what we've learned from there and do some uh, paper um, prototyping, right? So what a bot could do, right? How it could work. Um, they spun up a landing page that described the bot, the value prop with a, with a call to action. Um, they also went to some discussion forums to, to really understand where are these customers online, so men would be seeking advice. And then um, they also did um, what I call Wizard of Oz, right? Which is um, basically faking like um, there was a bot. And so if you look at how this kind of played out, so one, you're taking what you learned from your customer interviews and you're feeding that into your paper prototyping design process. And then you're taking what you've learned from paper prototyping and you're feeding that into your landing page design. And then you're taking what you've learned from landing page and you're saying, how would I go and kind of um, articulate this and acquire customers on discussion forums? And then when they hit our landing page, we're going to have a Wizard of Oz where um, we are going to uh, have a team of women, small team, act like a bot. And so when people SMS the, the bot, they're really talking to a group of women who are all using the same tone and, and language and sort of sentence structure. Now, where this one went horribly awry <laughs> is uh, here, a uh, thousand plus signups uh, as soon as it went live within like hours. Now that caused some problems over here where you have, you know, uh, basically, you know, a team of women that was, I think it was only like two or three, if I remember correctly. 
uh, trying to frantically um, basically respond to a, a thousand men <laughs> asking for for advice. So they're like, what is going on? <laughs> like, and they were completely overwhelmed. And so um, the the men were like actually complaining that they were so like hopeless that even the bot was ignoring them. And, and that certainly wasn't the uh, intent. So uh, in hindsight, you know, and they did this pretty quickly is, you know, they, they created a wait list to basically um, uh, stem the flood of incoming demand for uh, <laughs> for dating advice. Now, it was really interesting because in that, um, there's all kinds of learning to be had, right? Uh, without building anything so much as other than a landing page and like the implementation to get texts and respond to them, right? Using like Twilio. Um, it was pretty amazing to see what they would uh, text and what they would ask. Like, uh, I'm going on a first date in a city and I want um, a bar that's really nice, but not too noisy. Like, where would I, where would I, would I take my date? And, and so if this was to be scaled and actually used, you know, it could have been something where um, you, you could have actually used the real um, evidence of, of text to inform a bot. That, that I don't think that was such a huge leap. I think this one, uh, if I remember correctly, where it kind of fell down was on the viability part. So desirability, people want it. Well, you we had a thousand, <laughs> it went like viral on Hacker News and had a thousand signups in a few hours. So yeah, men, men wanted it. I guess Hacker News was like the ideal target customer in this regard. Um, is it feasible? Well, I mean, this thing didn't scale, but it, it's feasible to um, have women kind of um, portray a bot behind the curtain, right? Until you get to the point where you actually build the bot and you start rolling it out. I think that that part was feasible. Um, is it viable? Well, no. I, like, would men pay for a bot to give them dating advice? I mean, back when this was tested, no. Now, there could have been some other options like ad revenue or partnering with like brands or maybe dating sites or something else. There could have been some interesting kind of plays on that, but viability is where, you know, this one struggled. But not every experiment fails or succeeds. You know, um, Jeff Bezos has this great quote of, you know, it's not an experiment if it can't fail. And so not everything I work on personally uh, is successful. And that's okay. I mean, we want to kill the ideas that we shouldn't invest in too and make better investment decisions. So, um, with that, I kind of want to pause there, and I know I'll be mindful of our time, and I'm curious if there's any questions that I can answer from the group. If anyone does have any questions, just feel free to pop them into the comment section on the right-hand side as well. We we do have a couple of questions, David. Um, sort of, sort of coming in on on sort of other channels here. If you don't mind fielding a couple now. Yeah, that works. We can do a couple now. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> this is this is maybe a sort of a tough one to sort of start with, but um, typically whenever you ask a um, a parent if they're <laughs> who their sort of favorite child is, they typically sort of lie and say they don't have um, a favorite, but we all know that they do. Um, do you do you um, have a favorite experiment from the from the book at all? Do, do I have a favorite experiment? Yeah. Um, that's tough. Um, you know, one of the ones that I think people look over, uh, this is so interesting. So I'm asking companies to say, all right, uh, what, um, like, can you share a story uh, of something new you're working on? And most of the companies are like, oh no, we can't talk about what we're working on. The one of the first people to respond that they could work, they could share a story was literally the national security agency, <laughs> the federal government. And they're like, yeah, we can talk what we're working on. And so one of the like minor case studies in the book that I really love is the NSA, um, basically there's this thing called a cube satellite. And so cube satellites are kind of like really small satellites. Satellites used to be the size of like a bus. Uh, and now they're really small, like almost like a Rubik's cube. And um, they're trying to get encryption on them because encryption, let's face it, you know, you don't want your satellite to get hacked. And so they did this really interesting thing where uh, they kept 
experimenting around this and they couldn't get um, the CubeSats encrypted. And they literally 3D printed their, what was an encryption solution. And they finally just brought it to stakeholders and they held up and they're like, here's a cube and here's our encryption like stick <laughs> and they don't fit, like here's the problem. And I thought it was just a really interesting way to use like 3D printing to uh, try to help move a conversation forward. And out of everybody going, oh, we can't talk about our new products. Like we can't talk about our new mobile app but literally the NSA can talk about it, satellite encryption with me. So um, it was. it's probably not the most popular one in the book, but it's certainly one of my favorites just because of, you know, this challenge with technology getting smaller and their ability to kind of use and still like encrypt things and do things at a smaller scale. I just thought it was such an interesting story. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Um, we do have another couple of uh, questions coming through. Uh, David, if you've got time to take those. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Good. Okay, so we've got one just in from uh, uh, JP here. So, in terms of uh, viability, what would David recommend in terms of design principles for uh, virality and effective product lead growth? Oh, um, you know, they're they're interesting. There's a lot of things that get kind of categorized under what Sean Ellis um, describes as growth hacking. Um, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the term growth hacking, but he was very intentional about why he called it that. Um, and I do reference him in the book too. So there are some things where, um, you know, thinking through how would I, in a, in a genuine way, get my customers to become passionate and evangelize me um, to uh, <laughs> other customers, right? Um, and so basically the way Eric frames this um, is like engines of, of growth, engines of value. And when you think of kind of growth, I, I like thinking through how would we get them to become passionate? Like um, basically the framing here, um, and again, I pull from law sources. So think of like Brent Cooper and Patrick Vlaskovitz, mm -hmm. um, like this aware, hopeful, satisfied, passionate kind of like framing people go through um, where I try to, to help teams to say, okay, how are people becoming aware of the, we exist? How are they becoming hopeful that what we do solves a real problem? Uh, are they becoming satisfied once they use it? And then are they becoming passionate because um, they've used it, it solves a real problem and they tell all their friends. And, and so I love that framing as sort of like a, a flow and how to reduce friction in that flow and also be genuine because you don't want people to become instantly passionate about it without ever using it. And you also want to be careful of um, people use like NPS scores and things like how likely would you be mm -hmm. to refer? Uh, I think you you have to be careful about that because people might say, yeah, I would refer it. But if you ask them how disappointed would you be if it went away, they're like, oh, I wouldn't be disappointed at all. And it's like, wait, why are you referring this to a friend, but you don't care if it goes away? Like there's something off with this equation. So I kind of have like flow charts in my book about how I approach that. But I love um, anything you can do to kind of reduce friction to help people become more passionate. And then from there, um, just making sure that, you know, um, what you do has longevity, right? So I think we've seen a lot of this stuff kind of backfire in the past where, you know, like Farmville took over your Facebook feed and, and eventually they got shut, to, you know, they got restricted because there's nothing but cows in my feed, right? Like yeah. virtual cows. So there are things that you have to be, you know, have like a moral compass with, but I think, you know, how you, how you transfer or, or um, how you, I don't want to say convert, but, but how you help grow like passionate customers, I think is a super uh, fascinating way to think about it. Good. Good. That's a, that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions coming in now, actually. Um, so another question just from Andrew. How do you get buy-in to run these experiments from stakeholders when looking to innovate within a larger organization? Yeah, that one's I get a lot. Um, <laughs> and I feel like maybe preaching to the choir a little bit with the people watching this and they're like, wow, I wish my boss was watching this. You know, <laughs> how do I how do I convince? That that's my first the C word, right? Convince. I hear that quite a bit. Um, one of the things we do in our masterclass, and we did it in the last one in December with Alex, was we just took out a section and we said, All right. Let's just talk about how we operate when we're going inside companies, you know, and and quite often we're looking for things that we can uh, show uh, some success, like an output or some sort of outcome on. Um, we can socialize something that we don't lead with the tools on. That may sound silly because 
literally my book is packed full of tools and I'm saying don't lead with tools. But I, I usually lead with sort of like, let's achieve an outcome. And then when people go, oh, how did you get that outcome? When we can say, oh, well, we just worked a different way and by use some different tools. And so I find that's much more successful than saying, oh, let's like use a canvas here. And people are like, why, why do you want to use a canvas? Like you're more excited about this like silly canvas than helping me achieve a goal. And so I try to lead with the outcomes. And I also be, I'm very careful of my language. So I use, um, with executives, I use, how do we de-risk this? How do we reduce our risk? How do we reduce uncertainty? How do we make better investment decisions? How will we go check? That's something I, I learned from Eric Ries at GE. Uh, I was one of the first people to help uh, GE start using Lean Startup, right? And when I'm in there, um, I would watch Eric operate and he would say, uh, well, I'm sure you're right, but what if we just went and checked? Like, wouldn't it be good? To, like, what would it hurt to check? And I would say, oh, there's no way this is going to work. And it did. <laughs> it worked all the time. And so there's something about the language, the tone, making sure you're not... Um, uh, portraying excitement about a process or a tool more than you are trying to help reduce risk and achieve an outcome. And I think that may sound kind of weird because of course you're trying to help with an outcome and the tools are the way to get there, but you do have to be mindful in the order of that because um, some executives and stakeholders will just shut you out because they're like, oh, you just want to use this new process. You don't really care. And that's not the case usually. It's more of just the way they hear and interpret things. So, um, Investment decisions, reducing risk, those are the kind of words and framing I use uh, to help soften kind of that conversation. Yeah, that definitely seems to be a popular question coming through, as is the next one here. Here, I was expecting this slightly earlier. Um, question here from Adrian. Are there any tweaks you would apply to your process when the target customer is an enterprise? Yeah, I mean, there's some, I work with enterprise startups and then I also work with um, big companies that are more B2B. And in doing that, there are a couple ways I approach it. One is um, kind of pulling back to kind of Steve Blank, right? Is, is this idea of who's the user customer, right? Of, of the product or service, who are the influencers, who are the recommend recommenders, who are the economic buyers, who are the decision makers? And I try to lay that, that out because quite often you have like your overall value proposition but it's not good enough. Uh, you need to be able to break that down into what is my value prop to the person be using this uh, versus my value prop to the person that has budget who is probably not using it, but has you have to get budget for, right? It has budget for you. Mm -hmm. And then um, that person may not even be a decision maker. That's someone else, maybe at the C level. And then you have to basically have a value prop to them. Otherwise, your whole thing implodes. So I, I remember um, being at some like uh, Mind the Product. So I spoke at Mind the Product in San Francisco and a bunch of other conferences around kind of Mind the Product and Product Tank. And I kept running into startups that were like B2B SaaS. And they're like, we're doing great, but we're almost dead. <laughs> and I'm like, what does that mean? And it was always, well, people love our product, but we finally got to the decision maker and they said, we're not putting our data in the cloud. Uh, we're not ever going to purchase this. And so like six months in, they think they're doing great. And then they're almost dead because all the decision makers, they, they waited far too long to get in front of them. And so I think unpacking your um, overall value prop into those sort of like value statements to each and then understanding what are the jobs, pains and gains of each of those, of user customer, mm -hmm. the um, economic buyer, the decision maker. And, and Alex lays this out pretty well in value prop design book too. Um, that's how I see the big difference. And the other one is, if you have a total of 10 customers, you can't burn through nine of them trying to find a value prop. Uh, so that's different in B2C where it's like, oh, well, the first thousand customers were confused, who cares, we'll go to another. But when B2B that, you know, you can't do that. So it's more of changing the framing of the conversation and trying to just co-create with them. Um, the good news is there's a lot of stuff in the book with facilitated exercises from like innovation games to, um, you know, clickable prototypes you could demo with them. There, there's all kinds of stuff you could do. But those are the two big framings of just not burning through nine out of your 10 customers. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, making sure you understand that landscape really well between user, customer, economic buyer, and decision maker. Good, good. Thank you. Um, we might have time if I'm cheeky and squeeze one more question in. If you yeah, mind. Good. Good, good. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Christopher. How do you manage signals from experiments in markets where there are long sales cycles? And um, he's given the example, I guess, of a regulated business to business. 
Yeah, it's tough. I mean, you almost have to just survive long enough to close deals. And and that was um, certainly at the first startup I joined, you know, we ended up selling to banks in the US and we had almost every large investment bank by the time I left there eight years later. And we were acquired for like 16 million in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a period where it was pretty shaky, right? We were trying to sell to consumers. It wasn't working. We had to strip away a bunch of tools that I personally spilt, spent long nights and weekends and way too much coffee building mm -hmm. um, to fit into the, the bank kind of flow for financial products. Um, and what I see is um, it's this parallel track of we have bigger stuff that might take longer, but in the meantime, we have to survive with enough runway to um, get some leading indicators or leading signals, as you say, to know we're on the right track. And so um, what I would advise there is have like a bigger, longer running experiment in that regard, but, but in the future, but in the same time, having other things you're doing to kind of um, give you evidence that you're at least somewhat on the right track. Um, to bake, bring that down a level, you know, um, between like doing a customer interview on a partner and signing a giant 30 page agreement that might take months, you could do an LOI, a letter of intent, and that would get you from, you know, okay, are they really going to sign this agreement? Uh, so sometimes it's a non-legally binding one pager that I see a lot of B2B companies use and it gets them beyond the verbal to something written. And so if they're writing something, you'll know pretty quickly if they're not even willing to put it in writing at all, it's probably not going to come through. But if they're willing to put it in writing right away, then it's like some leading signal that maybe they would sign something bigger with more like kind of teeth to it. So um, just think through what can you do possibly to, you know, nudge your way on the right track. It's similar how I, like when I advise at Singularity University, most of their startups are in space. And it's like, well, if you want a 3D print on the space station, you don't like build the next 3D printer and then just launch it and years later and see what happens, right? You have to kind of test your way through that process. So um, it's kind of this idea of thinking big and testing small. And so, and so anything you can do to kind of generate evidence um, that you're on the right track in the meantime. Uh, it doesn't mean you constrain your vision to something really small, but uh, I, I would hate for you to wait, you know, six months, a year, two years later, and then realize, oh, none of that was like strong evidence and we failed in a big way, not in a small way. That's great. I'm sure that answers your question, Christopher. Thank you, David. Um, okay, so we're pretty much, well, we're over time. So thank you very much, David. Um, yeah, just want to say um, on behalf of, I guess, the whole group here, um, Thank you very much for giving us your time tonight and those very, very insightful um, pieces about the book. Uh, a bit like Eilish, I've got the book here, so still, still working my way through it. So um, it was great to hear you. I think there's some comments here as well. Um, I think it was quite refreshing, your your approach. Um, lots of doodles were, were well appreciated, it, it looks like, so from, from the comments coming in. So thank you for that. Um, we didn't get through all the questions tonight, so um, uh, David has very kindly um, ag agreed that feel free to to himself or indeed product tank. But you also mentioned, David, that there is a very good resources um, link on your website, which I have just added to the comment section. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, David, about what's available on that resources link? Yeah, um, everything I publish now. So, you know, I, I wrote on a single v feature MVP today about Amazon. Um, but there's videos that are free to watch there about how to do some of this. There's also um, free like uh, type form to go through assumptions mapping. I link to the mural template. So I partner with mural and there's an assumptions mapping template there, a PDF of how to facilitate it. Uh, if you sign up to the newsletter, you get a free uh, PDF sample of the book. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff I try to give away for free. So yeah, definitely take advantage of the resources section because quite honestly, I'll probably just point you to there anyway <laughs> because there's so much there already um, and not necessarily do one-on-one -on -one video calls. So yeah, but happy to give back, happy to help out, folks. Thank you, David. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, so yes, um, it's probably also worthwhile saying that in the sort of in the interest of doing experiments, this for ourselves, Product Tank Belfast. Uh, each one of these meetups is an experiment, so do you definitely give us some feedback, um, especially on Twitter. At least you have the hashtag and uh, Twitter account now sort of set up and going. So um, yeah, definitely give us some feedback. Um, I see some great feedback coming in from, from yourself, David, as well. So um, also worthwhile calling out that we have the next Product Tank. Um, it's coming up on the 20th of April, isn't that correct, Yelish? Perfect. 
Thank you. I can see you nodding, so that's a good sign. So that's great. That that will be hosted by uh, Bizarre Voice as well. So hopefully we'll see you all there. And thanks again, everyone. Thanks, David.